I have served on the city council. So um, as you know, we always have a public hearing for the budget, at, which is uh, prescribed by the charter that we do that, and we had that a couple of weeks ago. Um, but we tr decided to try something a little bit different this year in addition to the public hearing, and that was to have a town hall meeting um, so that to invite the citizens to come and listen to the city manager talk about how the budget has been developed and what the priorities of the budget are this year in accordance with our adopted strategic plan. Um, so our strategic plan, Independence for All, is, um, was adopted last year and really focuses around four key goals, and one of those is financial sustainability. Um, that was a plan that was um, unanimously adopted by the council in the first year of that plan. We completed 20% of our goals, so we're right on target to complete the plan in five years. Um, so tonight's conversation is really a direct result of that effort to bring greater financial sustainability to the city and also to bring greater citizen engagement. So our city manager, Zach Walker, will um, walk us through the general budget process and the key points of interest in this budget year. And we you know, encourage you to stay and listen. Um, and at the conclusion of this, of his presentation, we will open it up for questions. Um, so I think you all received cards on your way in. If you have questions, feel free to jot those down. Um, and we will um, get to as many of those as time allows after the presentation. So I'd like to, at this time, introduce our city manager, Zach Walker. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, members of the City Council, and thank you, uh, citizens and folks of Independence, for coming out tonight. Uh, as the Mayor said, um, this is a process that's required by the Charter every year that I develop a budget, uh, recommendations. I propose that to the Council, but I think what's been missing in years past is really that opportunity for us to bring the show on the road and ask our citizens, um, what do you think? Um, here's what's in. Here's not what's in. Here's kind of the general condition of the city's finances um, and provide that feedback. As the mayor said, we have the charter requirement to have a hearing, but we really want to do this in a more informal way. So apologize I'm behind the podium like the preacher here, but it's um, we'll try to keep it as loose and uh, open uh, as we can. Um, I'm going to try to get through this pretty quickly, about 20 minutes or so, and then uh, open it up so that we can engage with all of you and, and get some thoughts on all of that. So. We'll try to leave plenty of time for that uh, on the back side of things. So really, as the mayor said, this budget process has been about building a better foundation for our city, whether that's a physical improvement, like some of our public infrastructure, whether it's building the prosperity of our residents in this city, whether it's continuing to grow residential, commercial, or industrial development. It's all about making independence from good to great, building a better foundation. And as the mayor said, one year into the strategic plan that we call Independence for All, I can tell you we're making progress. We've got a long ways to go, I admit that, but we're making a lot of progress here. Here's a couple highlights of some things that I'm proud of that we got done in the last year. We've seen a 15% increase in our social media following. So this is the Facebook and the Twitter and all the other things that I don't even know about. But these are the things that our younger generations and others are really saying that they want to engage with the city on. So we're trying to put ourselves out there. We still do the city scene. We try to still put info in the paper. But we're also trying to capture the new ways that our citizens like to engage with us, seeing a tremendous amount of growth in that area. We've worked with our city departments, our seven public employee unions, to do a citywide market salary compensation study. Uh, we completed that earlier this spring. We're finalizing those details now. That goes to city council in June. That's to make sure that every single employee in the city is commanding and receiving the wage that the market says that they should be bearing, and some I'm really proud of there. We've worked with our Community Services League to try to raise the prosperity of our residents. We used some of our federal block grant funding to start a job training program. We've now had over 50 independence residents who have either received um, certified nurse assistant training, MIG welder training, or call center training, and all of them have now received jobs here in the city working uh, and at a higher wage. So we're proud of that. 
And of course, we've seen a substantial increase in our commitment to property maintenance code enforcement. And I gotta tell you, the results have been staggering. We've got an 81% increase in our cases that we're getting to in five days or less. We've got an 88% increase in proactive enforcement, meaning the citizen didn't call, we went out and found that issue. And here's the one I think is really cool. We've lowered the number of days to get a dangerous building demolished in the city from 120 days down to 40. That's a lifetime if you live next to one of these ugly structures or one of these dangerous structures. And our citizens are joining in on this as well too. 91% of our cases are now being addressed through voluntary compliance. So our citizens really deserve a pat on the back for stepping up their game as well too. Okay, like I said, all that's been good, but there's still challenges ahead. It is not all sunshine and rainbows in the land of independence. Um, municipalities across the country, independence included, continue to be challenged by what I describe as a dramatic shift in the way government works. The traditional revenue sources, the traditional ways that we operate, those are changing dramatically and rapidly. Independence was really set up to thrive and survive on sales tax, and this makes sense, right? You drive through 39th Street, you see the shopping centers, you see the mall. These are our bread and butters, and it served our city well for many years. But now people are going to Amazon to shop. People are going to eBay to shop. They're going directly to these stores' websites to shop. We don't get the same sales tax we used to anymore. You're going to see a chart here in a minute. That, that's a dramatic decrease. We are very proud that we have our own municipally owned utilities, and that's been a good bread and butter source for this city. But as people start to buy more energy efficient appliances, they consume less water. These are all good things for the environment, but again, it's less revenue to the city. Well, we can sit around and bury our head in the sands and we can cry about it and we can say, oh, poor pitiful us, or we can manage and we can lead. And we can say, let's reinvent ourselves. Let's find the ways to provide the basic services that our citizens expect out of us without crying foul about that. So here's what we're doing. We meet with our council every year now and we ask them, what are the key core things that you wanna focus on? We did this last year in November on Veterans Day, we met at Drum Farm. And this wasn't to develop a new strategic plan, we've already got one of those, but this was really about focusing on what are the parts of the plan you wanna focus on this year. Eight key areas the council identified this year, everything from reducing crime and disorder, to improving our city facilities, to addressing these municipal finances. These are the priorities that our city council, based on the feedback they're getting from their residents, are telling us focus on and make these priorities as you work on your budget for the coming year. So that's what we did. Now let's talk a little bit about the budget picture that we faced when my team and I sat down this year. Right after the time we finished our turkey legs up at Santa Caligon, we went back to work and started working on the budget. And I can tell you that this could have been a really easy budget year, relatively speaking. What I mean by that, our general fund revenues were decreasing from last year by about $658,000. On top of that, our expenses for things like personnel, for things like insurance, our base expenditures were going up by about $660,000. So all in, we had about a $1.3 million challenge in the general fund. In a $76 million general fund, that's, that's manageable. I don't mean to make light. 1.3 is a lot, millions a lot of money for any of us, but it was manageable. But we decided to go the extra mile this year. We decided to focus on those things that our council is hearing our residents say are priorities. In the past, I can tell you these might have been considered nice to do's, but we're not considering things like police and fire and good living wages for our employees and parks and streets, nice to do's. We're considering these must to do's. And all in this list, these priorities totaled $2 million. We left ourselves a pretty big gap to cross, but we decided to take the challenge head on. So this is what the budget picture looks like. We're gonna kind of zoom in from now, we'll start broad. Um, this is the budget picture for this year. Uh, we've got three primary funding sources at a high level. We've got the enterprise funds, which is your power and light, water and sewer fund. And that's the biggest part of our budget. That's 68% of the city's budget. That would be um, uses that are specifically for those three things, power and light, water, and sewer. We can't use those to pay for cops or firefighters or things like that. We've got our special revenue funds. That's the sales taxes that the voters have approved. That's our hotel tax. Those have to be specifically spent on the things that the ballot language said. 
So to fix the streets, to buy equipment for police and fire, to maintain parks, things like that. And then of course the fund that affords us the greatest flexibility is the general fund, but as you can see that's really only a quarter of our budget. That's $76.6 million. Um, that's the thing that does pay for all the general basic services like police and fire and, and all that. That's the one that has the most flexibility, but it's the one that's the, um, the smallest chunk of our budget too. All right, so where does the money come from? Well, the biggest chunk of it, of course, comes from the people that live here, the people that pay taxes, the people that shop in our stores and eat in our restaurants, and the visitors that do that. That's 45% of our budget. Um, I want to highlight something over here real quick because I know this is a little small to see. This number right here, all in, all in our budget is only growing by 0.7%, so less than 1%. Our sales tax collections are basically flat. They're going up 0.2%. Our pilots, I told you about that, with the money we get from the utilities, only going up 0.6%. You can see fines and court costs going down 7%. State of Missouri's passed a lot of laws in the last few years that restrict our ability to collect fines and court costs from defendants that are found guilty. So all in, general fund budgets going up less than 1%. So not only do we have the challenge of the, the number we're trying to balance, but we're doing it with a pretty small margin for error and a pretty small margin of growth in the budget. And this is how we decide to spend the general fund budget this year. 70%, the largest chunk of that goes to public safety. That pays for police and fire. It pays for the men and women that work in those departments. It pays for the equipment. It pays for the training. It makes sure that we all sleep well at night and are safe during the course of the day. Um, smaller amounts throughout there, but you can see we've got uh, money for public works, community development, Parks and Rec and the general governments, all else like finance and law and human resources and kind of the, the backbone stuff of, of city government. So that's where you can see. Something I would highlight here, again, I know it's kind of small to see and we'll have this uh, online for people to see too, but that last row at the bottom and the farthest part over here, we have cut the budget in the general fund this year by 0.1%. So basically we kept the budget flat this year. So just to connect the dots again, not only are we adding $2 million of new priorities, not only are we meeting a $1.3 million shortfall, but we're doing so by basically keeping the budget flat. And I'll show you how we put all that together here in a minute. So now I want to kind of talk to you about what are some of the key areas of focus in the budget. This is where we'll start to get into some of the highlights and the nitty gritty. Again, the budget for us is all built around this idea of independence for all, the strategic plan that is made up of four primary goals customer focused, financial sustainability, quality, and growth. So when we sit down, we say, what, how do these priorities align with these four things? So let's talk about each of those in a little more detail. Uh, customer service. We've got to make sure that every single time you interact with the city, you as a customer have the most positive experience and the most positive interaction possible. Because if you're not satisfied, the rest of what we do doesn't really matter. So there's a lot of things that we're adding in this year's budget, a couple things I'll highlight for you. We've recommended adding what we're calling a multimedia coordinator position. Remember I told you that we're finding out from our citizens they really want to interact with us more and more through digital stuff, through videos, through social media. So our parks department, parks, rec, and tourism is going to pick up two-thirds of this cost so that I can promote all the historic sites, all the tourism activities in the city. General Fund's going to pick up a third of it to promote the other general stuff going on, but we're going to try to make sure residents and visitors alike have the very best perception they can of the City of Independence and know what's going on here. Uh, we're also throwing some money in there for uh, video production, okay? So we're going to put some folks on contract to help us do that because, again, our folks are telling us, I don't want to read an article, I don't want to spend all that time, I want to see some clips and some videos and some things like that. So we're jumping through that. Um, sorry, jumped ahead there on myself. Um, one of the cool things that I would highlight that I think we're doing this year, we're going to purchase what we're calling customer relations management software. It's going to cost us about $19,000. What we're going to be able to do, you're going to be able to pull out this phone, you're going to be able to download what we call an app. You can send a request to City Hall. You can either take a picture of that dangerous building, you can take a picture of that grass, you can take a picture of that pothole, you can send it to us just like you send your friend a text message. We'll get that at City Hall, we'll know what's going on, and then you can track your case all the way to completion. So you won't have to keep calling and saying, I wonder where they're at with that, is City Hall ever gonna get this done? You'll know real time what's going on. A lot of cool things going on in this area of customer service. 
Financial sustainability was our big area of focus this year, like I told you. This was a, a, a primary objective for me and my team when we sat down. We really wanted to make sure that we laid a foundation not just for this budget year, but for all the budget years going forward. And we had a lot of discussions about what does that mean. I can't guarantee that it's always going to be perfect. I can't guarantee that there's never going to be financial hardship. But what I can say is we're going to ask ourselves the tough questions about what are those things that we can address so that moving forward, the city's in a better position, not just today, but for generations to come. Through a lot of thoughtful discussions, I think we're getting there, um, and we'll share a little bit of that with you here tonight. Um, we made this budget what I would call reorganizing around priorities. Remember I told you we had certain ways of doing business, but we knew that there's new things that we wanted to be doing. So I want to talk about a couple things that were certainly difficult decisions for us, but things I want to help uh, get the word out there about. We have a health department, um, but what we decided to do this year is reorganize some of those functions and responsibilities to help still meet our public health obligations, but also to save our citizens money and put that money where it uh, makes the most sense, but also, third, have the most uh, public health service that we can. So the functions that were known as health inspector, that's the people that go inspect the restaurants, that's the people that inspect swimming pools and hotels. We move that from the health department to community development. We're really turning our community development department into a business liaison, business orientation department. So now you're gonna have a one-stop shop where you can come get your plan reviews if you wanna open a business, get your business license to open a business, get your inspections done if you're a restaurant or a lodging establishment. So we still have all that, we've just moved it to a different department. Uh, we took our animal control function, we put that in the police department. Oftentimes we were finding that our animal service officers, their 24-7 function, police a 24-7 function, they work on a lot of the same cases, so if they had to, you know, unfortunately go arrest somebody and there was a dog in the house, animal control gets called in to take that and impound that animal. So there's a lot of natural cooperation already happened there. Last thing we did was we kept our wellness function. We really see a way that we're going to control our long-term cost by improving the wellness of not only our employees, but of our community. So of course our parks department, they have the parks, they have the Palmer Center, they have this building you're sitting in. They have all the functionality, but they didn't have the people that do the programming. So we're transferring those people that focus on that to the parks department, matching the physical assets with the people that do the activities. All the other stuff, the community education on public health and wellness, these are things that our Jackson County Health Department was providing those services already. And they sit on Liberty Street where our health department sits. We found that we were often bumping into each other. We've had great dialogue with them over the last three months since we made this decision. They're inheriting a lot of those responsibilities. They're very excited about it. Of course, now the only city in Jackson County that maintains their own independent health department is Kansas City. Independence joins Blue Springs, Lee Summit, every other Jackson County municipality that uses Jackson County for all those other services. Okay, next on our list, we had a copy center. Um, we found that we were going to be able to provide those services cheaper through outsourcing. Uh, so we have made that decision. We have consolidated what we call finance and administration. We're taking human resources, tech services, and finance and turning that into one department. We're trying to get smaller at the top, okay? We're trying to make sure that not only do we get smaller at the top, but that we provide the best internal service to our employees so that in turn, they're best equipped to serve all of you. Last thing we did was we set up a department called Public Utilities. This is called for, or I should say allowed for, in our charter. It combines water, WPC, and IPL into a single standalone department. We're still gonna have Department of Water, Department of Sewer, or WPC, and IPL, but we've appointed our, one of our assistant city managers, Mark Randall, to oversight that. This saves Independence Power and Light $300,000 by not filling the director position, but it also gets better coordination between these utilities. How many times have you been frustrated that we come in and we repair a street or we underground uh, electric utilities and we're back two weeks later cutting the street to put a water line in? We want to make sure that we spend our money and operate in the most efficient manner possible. So those are some of the reorganizations that we did. Okay, here's some things that we did around our employee benefits this year. Um, we have budgeted across the board for every single city employee a 1% increase, um, except in those cases where we already had a work agreement with the union that dictated a different amount. 
so that that is budgeted that is part of that six hundred and sixty thousand dollar base budget that i showed you a few slides ago i mentioned to you in my opening remarks about the compensation study that we did and what we found was there were places where some of our employees really lagged behind what the market said they should be paid so we are adopting or pardon me we are going to propose to the council for adoption on june 18th a new pay plan and as part of that employees who fall below the minimum of what their new pay range is we're going to bring them up to that citywide that's going to be a hundred and twenty thousand dollar commitment but i believe that by doing right by our employees here that we're going to have improved morale improved workforce improved productivity for our citizens um, workers comp workers comp is a very important necessary part of our budget but it can be costly and we had a couple big ticket items this year and we have the obligation to pay for that but we also have to adjust so because of that we're adding an extra hundred thousand dollars to stabilize that fund this year last thing um, our employee groups we have a thing called the stay well committee it's a, a really a collaboration of all of our our non-represented employees and all of our seven public employee unions they have managed our stay well self-funded health insurance program so well that for the fourth straight year we are going to have no premium increases for our city employees that means it's more money in their pocket for take home and it means it's more money that goes into programming for you as citizens we're not the city's not paying more money for health insurance they're paying for the basic services you expect we also took a look at some of our health insurance stuff and i know that this is an, an issue that I've, I've heard from a few of you here tonight that you're interested in and i want to talk about this a little bit and then of course hear from you in a while too um, there's three things that after we looked at our budget we decided to propose for this year um, health insurance is an important thing for us i mean it takes care of our people it can be a competitive recruiting tool it's a way that we retain employees but we also have to make sure that what we're doing is sustainable over the long haul so we have three proposals that we put out there this year i had a group that we call our pre-2009 retirees uh, who were paying a premium differential of 83 percent versus 17 percent uh, where our other current employees and active retirees were paying 80 20. Uh, we've proposed converting them to the same 80 20 split which will save the general fund in this first year $95,000 and over the long haul 100 or over the total $135,000 in, in one year I didn't mean the long haul pardon me second proposal we put out there right now the city offers as part of its employment package what we call retiree health insurance so if you work for the city for 20 years it used to be five they changed it to 20 uh, you get to stay on the city's health insurance plan uh, and, and it is a competitive uh, program for us but that is a seven million dollar annual expenditure for us as well too as a city so we looked at our peer cities and i found what columbia missouri is doing which appealed to us which is saying that any new hire um, that comes in after july 1st is our proposal that they would then absorb 100 percent of the cost they would pick up the same benefits the same all that but they would pay the full lug um, we have talked with our non-represented and our public employee unions about forming a committee to further study this so that we can figure out ways to mitigate that cost because here's the challenge public employee or public safety employees are eligible for retirement at age 55 and you don't kick on to medicare till 65 so that's 10 years of lugging that cost around so we want to figure out how can the city set up some kind of a deferred comp or contributory program where when people retire they've got something to draw down on to pay those costs um, we do not we had a lot of discussion on this item i want to pause one more time there at the end of the day we found cities like springfield missouri who dropped the guillotine and said it was good but it's over this program's done this did not appeal to me our employees worked under a certain set of circumstances our retirees had this expectation people make retirement plans we wanted to make sure that this doesn't affect any of those current retirees or active employees that's why we're proposing the july one last thing on here i'll jump through this quickly the dental change we're proposing to switch that from 80 20 cost share to 60 40. we found that only about 75 percent of our employees are using our dental anyway and this would be uh, the most expensive hit that somebody would take is adding $18 a month to their bill if they're on the family plan. A single employee, it's uh, um, $6 a month for them increase. Okay, so this is our general fund fund balance. All of you have a savings account at home. The city has a savings account. And what you can see here is in years past, we ran the savings account way down. Uh, as recently as 2013, we were about $600,000. 
Uh, if an ice storm came, if a tornado hit, if a really big expenditure hit the city, we were not well positioned to uh, handle that. More importantly, our credit rating agencies look at this, and when they see that number that low, the city gets a bad credit rating, which impacts how much interest we pay on debt. We've made a concerted effort to grow out of that, and this council's taken the bold step to set a new fund balance target of 16%. I'm pleased to say that the recommended budget sets that fund balance at 8.1% or just a hair over $6 million. So we're halfway to where we wanna to get to. This is gonna be a gradual increase. It won't happen overnight, but we're trending in the right direction. Other thing that's going on in this budget, um, truing up expenses. It's my belief that as a citizen, you should be able to look at your budget and know what, what are my tax dollars paying for. And, and that's not been the case in years past. Um, we've just kind of shifted from year to year. We challenged ourselves in a lot of ways this year. We trued up our general fund budget to the tune of 1.3 million. Here's what I mean by that. Say that our rubber band budget in the parks department was $100, but we were only spending 50. We challenged the parks department to tell us why do you need the $100. In most cases, our department showed great leadership and said, you know what, that's just an old number, we need to true that up. That captured $1.3 million of savings in the general fund. Um, other places that we're truing up, uh, fleet replacement. Most of our city functions have a dedicated funding source to provide adequate fleets. So fire's got a tax, police has a tax, um, the utilities, uh, power and light, they've all got their rates that pay for this stuff. The general fund's kind of fallen in the crack here and our fleet replacement is woefully behind. Um, we don't need to drive around in Mercedes Benz, but we also don't need to be spending exorbitant amount of money repairing a vehicle when it's cheaper to buy a new one. That's not good use of your taxpayer dollars. So we're starting a fund to start to cycle out some of the oldest and worst of our fleet. Outside legal services, um, just in the course of the business, city finds itself involved in litigation from time to time. We've under budgeted that historically, so we're increasing that by $42,000 this year. And then finally, um, we pay overtime. We've got employees who work all hours of the night, call, come in on special events. Snow removal is a perfect example of this. We pay them overtime. Historically, we have not adequately budgeted for that. In this budget, we're taking a step in the right direction there as well too. General Fund's not the only one who is making sure that we're being responsible. Our utilities are as well. Um, I commend our utilities directors. They're making sure that they keep up with routine maintenance. They're not deferring this stuff where all of a sudden we have to have these huge rate increases to take care of power lines and water mains and all that stuff. So we're funding capital maintenance at a level to keep up with routine maintenance. We're un eliminating what I would call unnecessary vacant positions, positions that maybe at one point in time were needed, but the functions change. That position's just been sitting on the books. Our utilities have really stepped up and they're capturing a lot of these vacant positions to help keep the cost down. Two big things that you all should know about happening in power and light this year that our council is going to be faced with. A cost of service study, figuring out how to make power and light more competitive financially. So some people hear cost of service and think, well, let's you know do another rate increase. Uh, council has said no to that. Uh, council is saying, figure out how to make us more competitive. Figure out how to get us in line with people like KCPNL and West Star and, and folks like that. Generation master plan. This is your power plant out on Truman Road. I say that term loosely because less than 2% of your power is being produced out there. Most of the power and in independence is actually purchased and brought in. So we're doing a study to figure out what is the future of power production, or I should say power supply and independence. Is it more cost effective to upgrade the antiquated legacy production equipment out there, or is it cheaper to go all in on purchase power and contracts? That's what we're studying right now to make sure we keep the cost down for you. Okay, so that's fiscal health. I hope I didn't lose anybody or put anybody to sleep there. Um, let's talk about growth for a minute. Um, we gotta start working on this revenue side of the ledger. We are looking to grow population in the city. We're looking to grow working income in the city. We're working to grow the number and type of businesses in the city. Those are the things that are gonna make sure more revenue start pumping into our budget and make sure that we're able to provide all the things that we wanna be able to provide. One of the things we put in, $10,000 for this group called the Kansas City Area Development Council. This is a consortium of 18 counties across the metro, and this is where a lot of the leads for businesses come from. Businesses don't really, they're kind of secretive. They don't want you to know they're looking at you. They want some of that discretion. So they work through this group on site selection. We've not really played in this pool at the level we should, and we've missed a lot of opportunities for it. So for $10,000, we're gonna be able to up our game, play at a higher level with them, hopefully bring more industry and jobs into the city. 
speaking of industry and jobs, I mentioned retail earlier. It served us well, but it's going away, and it didn't really pay that well to begin with. We're looking to bring manufacturing jobs back to Independence. We're looking at an area, Little Blue Parkway and R.D. Mize Road, we're calling the Eastgate Business Park. That's going to require the city participation to a degree, looking to use some of our street sales tax funds to put initial access road in there. We're talking heavily with developers right now from there who would build these buildings and bring the jobs into our city. So stay tuned on that. Um, let me jump ahead here. Transit challenges. Um, many of our citizens in the city heavily rely on public transit to get to jobs, to get to their doctor's appointments, to go visit friends and family. So we know that we need to continue investing in this. This is a key part of what our citizens use and expect from us. Because of the popularity, the cost is going up. And I can tell you in neighboring Blue Springs, they cut their transit bus this year. They got rid of several of the bus routes they had. We're choosing to go the opposite direction. We're choosing to not only maintain existing service, which is a $127,000 increase, but we're choosing to add an additional 70 grand so that we can add an hour of bus service. Right now, the transit routes all stop at six o'clock. That can make it difficult for those who have an appointment late in the day or who don't get off of work until 530. So we're making sure that we add that additional hour and extend all the routes to seven o'clock. Okay, this is the last area here. So we'll wrap this up with this. We're focusing on quality in the budget here. Um, the budget really focuses on the visual appearance of the city. Um, the council has really come up with an important philosophy of let's try to target some of our investment in areas so that we get maximum impact for our dollars. One of the areas that we're going to pilot this uh, is along College Avenue. College Avenue connects Nolan Road up to 24 Highway just north of the square. Um, we're going to use some of our federal block grant funds to do street, sidewalk, and other infrastructure repairs in that area. So we found this to be a main cut through for folks who are either coming to the square or headed to Christman High School. Council wants to try this as a pilot project this year, and we're going to use some of our federal funds to try to do that. We're also going to look to improve other infrastructure that we own and are responsible for. One of the biggest ones, just to give you an idea, if you head out east out of here or west, pardon me, on Truman Road, down by Ted's Trash, Truman Road, <coughs> Terrace Avenue, there is a huge sinkhole that has opened up under the road there. Drive fast when you go through there. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> if we don't address that soon, Truman Road is at risk of failing. We put $250,000 in the budget this year to shore that up, to remediate that, and make sure that we've got the funds adequate and necessary. We're also going to be working over MoDOT to make sure that because that is state highway through there, that they pay their fair share for that as well. Okay, we're also looking at blight. Um, it wasn't a one and done year with blight. For all the things I touted, we've still got a long ways to go there. We're increasing our dangerous building demo for the second straight year, the budget for that. We're increasing our property maintenance budget for the second straight year. We're adding an eighth code enforcement officer to get out there in our 78 square miles and inspect this city. Um, as you, some of you know, we recently acquired Rockwood Golf Course. We're responsible for that thing now. So we've got money in there to remediate some of the dangerous buildings and the property conditions there. So these key corridors, these neighborhoods, we're going to make sure that we get these cleaned up to the standards that our citizens have set. Uh, commercial business compliance. Last year, we started what we called Regulated Industries Division. As a city, we're responsible for overseeing 6,000 commercial business licenses and 100 liquor licenses. And right now, we got two people over that. So this year, we're adding a third business license compliance officer, not only for the customer service standpoint, but also to get out there, because unfortunately, there's some bad apples out there. There's folks that don't comply with the law. We want to be proactive and make sure that they are holding up their end of the deal when it comes to business operations. Last thing, playground and uh, park maintenance. Um, we have a dedicated park sales tax for that. Some of that money had been programmed out in previous years for stuff. We're coming into a season now where we have ample opportunity to start to replace the aging programs, to revitalize some of our tired parks, to begin to implement some of our trails plans so that you can walk and bike and hike uh, in some of our parts of town. So our park sales tax, you're really going to start to see that kick into gear this year as well. More than that, we're actually able to add an additional park maintenance crew so that more quickly we can come and mow the, uh, the parks, we can take care of the issues that you identify in the parks uh, and address those quickly. Public safety. Public safety is a huge part of this budget. Um, as some of you know, our fire chief, uh, Doug Short, who's here tonight, recently promoted up from deputy chief. Uh, I have to commend Chief Short here. He's come up with, with a very innovative plan. Um, 
he is electing to not backfill his position. Remember I said trying to get skinnier at the top. That's going to save the general fund in and of itself $50,000. The remainder of the budget he's allocating this way you see here. He's going to add another administrative assistant to be able to do the scheduling, the shift changes, all that kind of stuff. Promote two of his battalion chiefs to assistant chiefs so that they can take on increased responsibilities that he previously had as deputy chief. And then here's an important one, add three fire captains so that they can focus on training and making sure our firefighters are as safe as they possibly can be when they respond to these emergency situations in our city. Police is getting in on the fund as well too this year. And this has been probably the biggest area of focus I would say in the budget. Um, law enforcement in this community, there's a lot of trends that I would say we're not necessarily proud of. We want to make sure we get on top of these and mitigate these circumstances. So here's some of the things we're doing. We're increasing our dangerous, our, our dangerous, our detention housing budget. I don't ever want to be an excuse that we can't put somebody away because we didn't have money. So we're increasing the budget for that. In addition to that, we're putting an extra, extra uh, supervisor in the detention unit down there, both for functional needs and safety of our employees and inmates needs. Look, jail's not supposed to be a fun place to be, but we still have a responsibility to keep people safe down there. We're adding a public defender. State law says that if we want to uh, sentence somebody to jail time and they are poor or what they call indigent defense, we have to provide public defense. So we are adding $12,000 to put somebody on contract to be the public defender. This police records technician, this is all about warrant entry, making sure that if somebody is um, uh, uh, issued a warrant, police department gets that issued. Converting one of our uh, civilian positions to a police sergeant who is going to oversee five new police officers in what we're calling our street crimes unit. We want a new police unit out there on the street, on foot, in car, on bike, whatever it is, patrolling your neighborhoods, making sure that all times of day and night, those are as safe as they can possibly be. It, it's not going to be a be all, end all, fix all, but for the first time in many years, this city is adding new police officers to our, our uh, sworn staff. And lastly, we've built a new um, communication center because of our citizen approved public safety sales tax. That's out there at 23rd and RD Mize. It's going to open here in just a couple of weeks. We've got adequate funding in there to make sure cost of operations, things like utilities and, and all of that are in there as well. So really, let me go ahead and wrap here and, and uh, turn the floor over to questions and comments and all that. But really, guys, this budget is a, a budget that was about transitioning, transitioning away from legacy ways of doing business, transitioning to make sure that we meet the key priorities and key needs of our citizens, making sure that we don't just bury our heads in the sand about the challenges that we're facing financially, but that we find new ways to provide those services, streamlining those costs, and making sure that we meet the key goals of our strategic plan. Here's where we go from here. Um, I'm glad you all could be here tonight for this. We actually did the same presentation for our employees today, uh, which was a first for that as well. We have information coming in your City Scene newsletter, which will be a quicker summary of this. June 4th and June 18th, these are our city council meetings. The mayor mentioned the charter required public hearing that we had on the 21st, but you're welcome to come and sign up to speak at any council meeting. So this Monday night is an opportunity to do that. That's when we have first reading of our budget ordinance. June 18th is uh, another night to do that. That's second and final consideration of the budget. So there's uh, opportunities for our citizens to come up and speak and address their elected officials there. That's it for us. I'll see what Meg has planned for us now. Mr. City Manager, Meg, I would uh, recommend since we have this only for about an hour. We will take questions for 30 minutes, so we'll answer questions for 30 minutes. It may go a little longer than that. I would propose that we take the cards as written, then open up the floor for 15 minutes for an open debate there. Any seconds? Okay. We will take questions for 15 minutes. If you can write down your questions on your cards and um, send those to the staff members that are at the end of the aisles, please. And those questions that we are unable to answer via those cards, we will answer on social media. Um, so look for as many of those as we can. If you are not comfortable writing, you can also ask our staff members to help you write that on your card, or you can send it to us now via Facebook Live, and we will pull some of those up as well. Um, so we'll do it for 15 minutes, and then we'll open the floor for 15 minutes, and we have a microphone available.
clear where the question is coming from. Okay. I'm going to get some of these first and then we'll get to them. Okay, I'm going to do my best to make these out here and um, uh, answer them after that. So this one says, how does reducing personnel, health department, et cetera, increase efficiency? It seems to me customer service will suffer. Um, that's been an important consideration for us. Um, we can't cut off our nose to spite our faces, or as my assistant city manager, Mark Randall, says, step over uh, dollars to get to dimes. So we were very thoughtful about this question right here. Um, in fact, I think we are increasing customer service. For example, if you went to get a birth certificate, it was confusing. Do you go to the county? Do you go to the city? The answer was both, okay? So there was a lot of duplication of services there. What I'm really pleased is we've maintained the key functions that make made us a health department, okay? We've got food inspections, animal control, and wellness. Those other functions that we didn't retain, those were functions that our Jackson County Health Department are providing. Now, they're providing those other services too, but quite frankly, I don't want to be in the same mixing pot with Lee Summit and Blue Springs and their pecking order when their restaurants are going to get inspected. I want to make sure the independence residents get their restaurants inspected by their independent staff and that they get done in a timely fashion. I didn't want to be subject to someone else's will and whim. Um, same on those other issues. So here's the other good thing. We're going to continuously monitor and evaluate this. If this if this doesn't work, if for some reason there's no reason that we can't try to go back the other direction, but we, we've got to try something different in light of what's happening with our budget right there. Um, so I'm telling you, customer service will always be at the forefront of our mind, and we'll see where we go from there. So I, I, I hope I, I helped get to that one there. I got a stack of these, so I'm going to kind of keep going, but look, we're going to have some time, it sounds like, for speaking as well, and then I'll hang around after this so I don't have to help put the kids to bed tonight. Um, how much does the city pay for the health department services to Jackson County? Um, we actually don't pay anything to Jackson County for health services. Um, that's paid for by you as Jackson County residents who pay your taxes. So we don't contract um, on that. Now there is one thing that we do pay for uh, directly and as a contract between the city and Jackson County with a third party operator for our animal shelter. So the city has operation responsibilities for that. We've contracted with a third party operator for that, but we're not paying the county directly for those services. That's the closest thing we have to that. Um, everything else is paid for by the taxpayers of this county. Uh, stay well clinics. Why isn't it available for the retirees? Call your congressperson. Uh, Medicare doesn't allow retirees to bill for uh, that. So therefore we can't take those in there. I wish we could. The stay well clinic's been a major success and it would help us control our costs because as a self-funded health plan, we pay 80% of the cost, okay? Whether you go to Walgreens or Centerpoint or the clinic, we're paying 80% of those costs. It's cheaper for us to have folks go to the clinic, but unfortunately, that's not what federal law allows for. Uh, Four-way stops on College and Parker. One of my staff write that down. We'll look into it. What is the city's plan for the Rockwood Golf Course? Rockwood is 91 acres. It is a big golf course. Um, right now, we have a 30-year lease with MC Power. It's a private company who are leasing 29 acres for community solar. Uh, this is allowing citizens, or I guess I'd say ratepayers, to sign up for purchasing a share in that so that you get green energy at your home. That leaves still 60 acres undeveloped. We're having a lot of discussions uh, with the council right now about that very issue. Um, it was imperative, I can tell you, I'll speak behalf of the council here, that the council did want to secure that to make sure it wasn't used for some adverse or negative uh, outcome that could negatively impact what is otherwise a very strong, stable neighborhood. Um, I wish I had a better answer for you on that tonight, but stay tuned on that as we continue to explore what's in the best long-term interest of that land and of the uh, uh, neighborhood around it. What are the plans for college, Barry power lines, code enforcement, question marks on both of those. This is gonna be a true demonstration site, so all these options are on the table. Um, we wanna get sidewalks on there. So Councilmember Perkins, Councilmember Huff, Councilmember Doherty, they've had me out there a couple times. 
Uh, I've had to jump out of the way of fast moving vehicles several times because there's missing segments of sidewalk through there. Um, and there is a very active pedestrian neighborhood that utilizes that area, as is uh, vehicular traffic cutting through between those main roads. Um, we're looking at the cost to bearing power lines. As you know, that can be expensive. However, it's also expensive when power lines get busted, uh, when inclement weather, wind or ice or something like that knocks those down. So we're putting together our action plan on college right now. Um, it was a major step for us to get the funding identified for that. We are doing targeted code enforcement in this area as well. In fact, we found a significant amount of land in there that was owned by Jackson County Land Trust and the trees had grown up very, very tall, had overcome some power lines and were at risk of creating a fire. Oh, we're starting, we're not finished, but we're starting on getting that brush cleared so that we protect our power and light infrastructure through there. But we're also going through checking on the neighborhood and I know we've issued some code violations in there and we've got others to come. Why did you raise insurance when it is not necessary? Um, you know, I decided it was. Um, it's a $7 million expense in our budget. I think we're talking about the retiree insurance. Our employees' premiums, I said, are staying the same this year, so we're not increasing their cost. Um, $7 million and a $76 million general fund is about 8% of the total budget, uh, and those costs increase every year because, as we should, we're paying our employees more and more every year, which means the insurance requirements go up more and more. Unfortunately, doctors and prescriptions and all that aren't getting any less expensive. What I want to make sure we always do is we stay competitive. I don't want to lose employees to Lee Summit and Blue Springs and all those other places. So we're making sure we keep our competitive edge, but I got to do it in a way that's making sure we pay for this stuff too. This isn't popular. I don't like doing this, okay? And I could have kicked the can another year or down the road or whatever, but I'm ch choosing to try to make it better. I'm choosing to try to leave it better than what we found it. It may not um, settle well with everyone, but we got to do something different because the ship's going down if we don't. This person wrote their name. Um, and I don't know if you wrote it, I'll read it for you. My name is uh, John Welkert. The retirees have asked me to make a presentation. May I have three minutes? It sounds like we are going to do that. But just a moment because we do have, Meg, some questions that also came in here as well as this was on Facebook. So we had some people put questions on Facebook as well. Okay. Uh, the very first one says, bottom line, uh, how many current employees will be losing their jobs due to budget concerns? Do employees need to be concerned? I have no other plans um, to eliminate or reduce existing staffing. Um, I don't have the total number at my fingertips, Ms. Pittman, but we'll get that posted. I know we eliminated 23 positions in the health department, 13 of which were filled, 10 were vacant. I know we eliminated four copy center positions, but those employees do have bumping rights in their union work agreement, and we're working to make sure that we can retain as many of those as possible. Um, that's it. So I'll confirm that and make sure we get that because I want to be accurate, but that was that question there. Are there other ones on here? Okay. Will there be any tax cuts for the homeowners surrounded by the new farmer's market if they fix up their homes? City doesn't have a personal property tax, so we can't give you a tax cut for fixing up your home on that. Uh, so I guess the answer to that would be no uh, there. Okay. Are there any further proposed changes in health care for retirees not covered during the briefing? No. What you saw here is it. There's no secrets. There's nothing coming out from under this podium. We tried to be as open and honest about this as we could. We went and met with our Stay Well Health Insurance Committee. I went and met with what we call our Labor Coalition, uh, on, I think on six different occasions, met with our city department heads many times. Look, I want to be clear, this recommendation is coming from me. It's not coming from any of those groups that I mentioned. But the feedback I got from them talked us through a lot of things and made us be thoughtful about a lot of things and ultimately led to the recommendation that I've made about this. But to answer this question directly, no, no further changes coming on health care. Why is there a difference in the current retirees' contribution for stay well coverage? Um, I wasn't here in 2009. I'm going to do my level best to answer this question as it's been explained to me. As I understand that the city switched in 2008 or 9, somewhere in there, to a higher participation level of loggers. I think we went from one and a half to two percent, if I'm remembering that correctly. 
there were some employees at the time that felt like they were not going to be able to capture the full benefit of that. And so a, um, a compromise was reached in order to allow them to pay a different level of uh, uh, health insurance, the 83-17% split. So that's what that was about. Okay, under fines and court cost, it was decreased 297,475 because of limits and controls on fines and court costs, and it hampers law enforcement efforts. What limits and controls do you want to change if you could? Oh, thank you for asking. Um, here's what happened. Everybody remembers Ferguson, Missouri uh, in 2015. This is where a young uh, African-American male was shot and killed by a member of the Ferguson Police Department. And after a lot of months of civil unrest, um, uh, the Missouri General Assembly convened back in session and they found that maybe there were some um, racial profiling or aggressive police policing practices happening. And rather than deal with Ferguson, Missouri, they decided to make this a state of Missouri problem. Here's the biggest thing that they did. They changed the law to say that we can no longer suspend somebody's driver's license for failure to pay. Previously, if you did not, if you got a speeding ticket, you were found guilty by the judge, you had 60 days to pay it, or the judge would call Department of Revenue and your license was suspended. This is not unlike if you don't pay your utility bill or your cable bill or your cell phone bill, you lose the privilege. Driving's a privilege. Well, they took that ability away. Um, career criminals are smart people and word travels fast and they recognize this and compliance has taken a nosedive. Uh, our council has worked very closely, not only with our local legislative delegation, but really have formed relationships statewide. We got really close this year. We got a, a senator from Springfield to introduce legislation, made it all the way to the floor of the Senate where it originally passed and on the final vote, um, seven, I'll call them individuals, changed their vote and the uh, bill failed for lack of support. Um, we'll get right back at it next year, but this is, this is not primarily a financial issue. This is a safety issue. Think about all the state and federal highways we have in our city. Do you wanna be around people that choose to not speed or cho choose to obey the law? Last one, why did you take away the promise made by Robert Haycock to not raise the insurance retirees? Um, I don't have any documentation of a promise and I'm not trying to evade you. All I'm trying to do is make sure that I balance the budget to the best of my abilities with the least harm and impact to people as possible. So um, I will be happy to discuss that more as, as we want to get into it, but I, I, that is the honest answer that I have right there. So we'll now have citizens um, come up to the microphone over here. You will have three minutes and we will be keeping time for those three minutes. Please state your name and address like you would at a uh, council meeting and we will continue. That better? That better? Uh, good evening. My name is John Welcher. I'm a retiree, and I've been asked by the retirees to make this presentation. We're asking the mayor and the city council to amend the city manager's proposed budget for 2018-19 and to leave the retirees' health care premium cost share at 17%. For those retirees who retired prior to 2009 and are covered under the Stay Well Open Access Plan 1. We make this request based on the following facts. <clears throat> there is no increase or additional cost in health care premium insurance scheduled for any other employees active or retired. There is no increase scheduled for open access plan two members. Their health insurance premium cost share will remain the same at 18%. The city manager's message found on Roman numeral seven of his proposed budget for physical year 2018-19 states, I concur with the recommendations made by the Stay Well Committee to make no changes to the health share health insurance premiums at this time. For those retirees who retired prior to November the 1st, 2009, by increasing their 17% cost share to 20% will result in a 17.6 increase 
and their monthly dollar health care premium cost. For me and my family, that's about $400 more per year. We asked the city manager to provide us the matrix justifying these changes for the retiree's health care premium. These additional funds are not being applied for any increase in the city's cost for health care insurance, but instead are being utilized as a cost-shifting measure to generate $138,000 annually, with $95,000 being applied to the general fund and $43,000 being applied to the enterprise fund. Further examination of the city's manager budget reveals the following items that were not presented at the study session on May the 14th, 2018 for the council's consideration of a true cost for services. On page 57, we find a 25% increase in salary and benefits for the office of a mayor. That's an increase of $36,000. On page 58, I find a 37% increase in salary and benefits for the office of the city council an increase of $112,000. A 40% increase in the salary and benefits of the city clerk, an increase of $61,000. With no change in two full-time positions, we found that on page 60. There's a 16.5% increase in salary and benefits for the office of the city manager and an increase in the public information office program of 337%. That's an increase of $312,000 for that line item shown on page two. A 479% increase in the finance and administration department's operating expense. That's an increase of $1,967,000. <clears> the <throat> council has the fiduciary responsibility to present a true accurate and honest cost of service. So far, these additional costs represent an increase of $2.5 million. To us retirees, it appears that the city has plenty of money. On behalf of myself and all the retirees, I ask for equity and fairness and for no increase and to leave the retirees' premium cost share at 17%. For all the retirees, please consider our request for no change and our health care insurance premium costs, we think it's a decent, just, and reasonable request. It demonstrates the city's appreciation for the retirees' service and values their worth as former city employees. We thank you for being fair-minded as you consider our request. Madam Mayor, may I please give you a copy of my presentation? Yes. My name is Marilyn Hennis, and I live out on East College, and I just wanted to get up and say thank you. <laughs> We've been very fortunate. I've been on that street for 55 years, and this is the first time that I feel like we've gotten any attention. John, bless his heart, he's been out, Mike Huff, he's been out, Zach's been out, Mr. Doherty's been out. They came out, they took the time on a very hot day to walk up and down the street, and and look at what our issues were. And I think you guys are doing a great job, but especially those guys. And I just wanted to get up and say thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me? Madam Mayor, Council, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Henry Carner. Uh, I live in Independence, retired firefighter. I'm on the L6 plan, not on the plan of the employees that's going to be affected. We have a two-tiered pension plan. The higher plan is L6, that pay, and that those people pay 20% of the premium, the city pays 80%. The lower tier is all the employees who retired before L6 became effective. The lower tier retirees pay 17 and the city pays 83% of the health care premium as a pension benefit. This lower tier was established by agreement with city manager Robert Heacock. We have people that were there at the meeting that are here 
out here tonight and has been in practice for almost nine years. With this long-standing past practice acknowledged by all, it has every appearance of an implied contract for the lower tier retirees and their widows who are on a fixed income and under a lesser retirement plan. The health care premium split for these retirees is not a gratuity. This lower tier retirees earn this premium split, uh, earn this premium as retirement benefits. Unlike L6 retirees, all lower tier retirees experience a significant reduction in their pension when they go on Social Security. The budget pr proposed change for this lower tier is an adverse modification of their health care uh, uh, pension benefits that is not supported by any valid economic, technical, or legal rash rationale. We know that the city manager rightly pushes that pen however he wants. So we note that the stable health care committee did not recommend any health care premium increase for any segment of those under the plan. At this point, it appears to be an arbitrary decision. We see no compelling justification for this sudden cost shifting of health care premiums for dedicated loyal retirees on fixed income. It raises the question, what is the real motive for this? The employees and retirees benefiting on the L6 higher of the two tiers system, have they agreed to the 20 and 80% split. And they understood that those the, the higher the retirees prior to that were under 1783. That was considered fair, just, and equitable. It all, this, and this split for those retirees with the lesser plan demonstrates the city's appreciation for their service, values their worth as former employees. Former city managers have made agreements with current and future, that current and future councils have uphold. The city has made no case that they are distressed by this premium split for these, this retire, lower tier, and it has the appearance of preying on our weakest active slash retiree community of, to free up funds for some undisclosed expenditures. Non-L6 retirees have been con con content and not got themselves involved in city politics, preferring to live quietly and, and at peace with the city. These employees are proud of their service and supportive of the city. This dynamic will surely change if they are delivered an unwarranted injury on their health care pension benefit. S such a needless slight could not bode well in the long term for our city. It boils now to honor, respect, and the city's good name. If the city chooses to renege on the deal they have with, the retire with these retirees, it will demonstrate a dishonor on the city and a disrespect, disrespect of loyal, dedicated employees who serve faithfully. It will further put the city's credibility with all active and retired employees at risk. If the city can manage to damage the weakest group, the slowest tier of the active retiree community of employees, then the city could go after any segment of our community and use a budget process to arbitrarily inflict economic damage on any of us. We plead, plead it's our prayer, please protect the city's honor and the retirees' dignity by withdrawing this proposal from the budget that will hurt our vulnerable retirees and our widows. Thank you very much. Good evening, um, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. I'm Renee White. I served as third district council member from 2000 to 2008. So I can tell you some of this conversation about the health care has been going on since 2007, 2008 uh, with the city manager at that time, Robert Haycock. At one point, he wanted individuals to work five years before they could even have health care when they retired. It didn't matter when they retired. And then he changed it to 20 years. And he told the council then, and I believe Perkins was on the council, that if we did that, it'd take care of all the money problems. It would never be a problem with the health care. Well, you know, health care is a problem about every year, so we were really glad to hear that. And it was agreed to, I believe, by the, the contracting unions and the city council. So I know I had that conversation with him because I've got to tell you, when he told me that people had to work 20 years to have medical care, I was not for that. Um, 
and my previous job for 35 years at Missouri Gas Energy, I would have been very afraid with those kind of benefits that a company or a city would simply become a training ground. You know, you'd have people come and learn to uh, climb a pole or dig a ditch, and in about four years they'd find somebody that gave them benefits, and they would be gone. And I have to tell you, when I was on council, I always got a lot of compliments on our city employees. And I think that's real important to the city, and it was real important to the council, too. And, you know, if you become a training ground, I don't think you get those kind of results. But I just like the, the mayor and the council, because you're going to be making these decisions. These are probably, based on their income right now, the lowest paid people in the city. Just based on, I mean, I don't know what other retirements they have, but they have the lowest paid pensions. If you raise their medical, you know, will they still be able to see the doctor of their choice where they want to go? Um, we have a number of employees that have young spouses. Are we still, when we have a loss of that uh, employee, are we still going to insure their spouse or their dependents? Some people have dependents. So those are some of the things that I'm very concerned. And then from an emotional standpoint, let's remember those 400, 500 people. You know, they were the ones that cleaned our streets when we had an ice storm. They climbed the poles, and they protected the public uh, from fires or from crime. And most of them didn't even have lights on at home themselves. And they were out doing that for our public. Uh, you know, code, all of them. They've all done that. And I just think that for 400 people, we're not talking about 4,000 people, where you, where you, what pool are you going to go to next and, and try and make that group? So. I appreciate your time, and if you give that some consideration, and ask Robert. Thank you. Okay, I think we got uh, folks in less, I put 15 minutes of what you wanted, Councilmember Perkins, so. Well, I thought we had one hour total. Okay, well, I mean, as far as I'm okay. We can okay. move forward, let's be here. No, it's, um, it's whatever. I was, the only, I was just gonna say one, one quick thing, because I did want to um, uh, make sure that I got everything. I don't wanna try to dump all the budget on you tonight, so let me just clarify one thing on uh, the pages that were mentioned about some of those departmental pages, th those costs are going up because we're shifting costs that were in this account called non-departmental into the accounts where those belong. Primarily, that is retiree health insurance. Um, I, I checked real quick and I looked. There's a decrease on page 156 of $6.4 million in non-departmental, primarily because we were shifting those retiree health insurance costs from non-departmental to the departments where those retirees worked at. So again, if you remember the slide where I showed the overall budget's down 0.1%, I'm trying to true up the budget so we can have an honest dialogue with you and with our community about where costs really belong. So true accounting. So that's, I just wanted to make sure I clarified that and, and got that in there. We do of course have the 1% across the board increase. Seems like we got some retirees here. You probably recall we do a half percent longevity increase every year. So there are some personnel costs going up there as well. We've also transferred some employees. I think I heard um, uh, public information. We had videographers that worked in tech services that we moved to the city manager's office under our PIO. So there's just some shifting that's happened in there to try to provide a better accounting for you all to understand. So, um, but I, I will continue to look at that handout and uh, uh, contemplate the things on there as well. Um, I will hang around a little while longer to answer additional questions. Um, uh, again, please consider the June 4th and June 18th meetings as well. And as always, please reach out by email or phone for me as well. Just yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I was curious how you arrived at going after the retiree 17% and not going after any of the department heads 
uh, valuable increases or yours or whatever. I'm just curious, do you want to pick on the weakest link? Is that what your thoughts was on that? Well, of course not. It's not. So, um, I laid off a health director. Um, I've consolidated three departments down into one in this finance administration. Uh, and when those employees retire, I'll probably take a look at bumping those down to division managers. Consolidated the three utilities and didn't fill the power and light director, which saved us 300000 And like I said a minute ago, I, I don't like this either, but I, I got hired to try to balance the budget, and the state of Missouri tells us we have to have a balanced budget. I wish I could work for the feds where they could run a deficit, but this is where I'm working, and I, I take it seriously, but I also take seriously the comments I've heard here tonight, and we'll continue to look at this while it's in there. I changed the dental from the 80-20 down to the 60-40 for our active employees. I'll continue to be here. Um, uh, zwalker at indebtmo.org is my email. Um, 7127 is my phone number. So give me a call. Thank you all for coming out tonight.